Welcome to Enviro Close Up. I'm Carl Grossman. The subject, electromagnetic radiation. And with us is Dr. Lewis Lesson. He is an expert in electromagnetic radiation, EMF, and all those things that you perhaps have been hearing about, reading about, seeing a little bit about, a serious concern. He's been the editor and publisher of a journal called Microwave News for lo these 17 years. In fact, a pioneer in looking into, well, the problems of this force, this radiation force that's let loose from power lines, from cellular phones these days, from electric blankets and so forth. But let's just first talk about cellular phones. Uh, I mean, they're, they're omnipresent these days in the United States, indeed, all over the world. A few years ago, there was some, or just kind of a flurry of uh, reports about, uh, well, cancer as a result of the use of cellular phones, health impacts. Basically, about four years ago, a, a gentleman called David Renard claimed on the Larry King show that his wife had died from using a cellular phone. Basically, she had developed a brain tumor and had subsequently died from that. And uh, he, he, he made public uh, announcements and, and caused quite a stir. I mean, in fact, the stock markets crashed. All the cellular phone stocks crashed. It was front page news all around the world. Unfortunately, there's very little data at this point to substantiate that claim. Not that it's, you know, not that it's impossible. There is a lot of data out there that's suggestive, but far from uh, evidence that, that you could take to a court and, and make a claim. He did file a, a lawsuit, uh, and uh, basically he lost. But as a result of that um, publicity, the cellular phone industry said, OK, we will spend five years, $25 million, to try and find out whether there's a risk. In fact, they put it quite differently, to show there is no risk, they said, which is not quite the right way to go about such a research program. But here we are, four years later, not a single biological study has yet been funded by the industry program. Basically, the government doesn't want to get involved, EPA, FDA, uh, all the kind of alphabet suit of federal agencies out there just don't want to do the research. We've delegated to the cellular telephone Industry Association, and they're basically not doing very much. In contrast, I should say that Motorola, um, I think, is basically bought an insurance policy. They've been watching the CTIA effort and see that nothing is happening. They have gone off in independently, done their, you know, started their own research program. But basically, here we are, four years later, we know very little about this problem, up to about a week ago. And a week ago, there came startling news out of Australia. Basically, the Australian telecom, now called Telstra, a very large national phone company, funded a major research project basically exposing mice to exactly the type of radiation coming from a cellular phone. Now, I should say it's a digital cellular phone, which is um, a bit different from what's mostly in use, but basically we're going digital in this country too. What they found was startling. What they found was that the mice developed cancer at twice the rate that the so-called controls, those unexposed mice. Um, and this was supposed to be impossible. There was no way this was supposed to happen. And um, it is front page news basically all around the world, in, in, in Israel, in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Australia. It, Actually, very little publicity here. I mean, the, I should say that the San Francisco Chronicle broke the story here in this country, put it in the front page just a week ago. Uh, but there's been very little pickup. Uh, Sun Sentinel did a piece, but very little else. Uh, and it, it, you know, this is crucial because, as I said, this kind of an effect was supposed to not be able to happen. We now have upwards of 100 million people using this technology worldwide. And estimates are within, you know, in the next decade, in, in the next century, we're going to have basically half a billion people using this technology. And, you know, it doesn't take a, a, an Einstein to work out that you're putting an antenna millimeters away from your brain, from your eyes. Um, there are potential risks here that need to be addressed, and they're just not being addressed. Power lines, I mean, they're all over the place. Again, a few years ago, there was great concern about power lines emitting electromagnetic radiation, this EMF. 
what, what is the situation today? Do we, do we know anything much more? We know a little bit more, but what's happened basically is that uh, industry has gone on a very strong offensive and have tried to say that there's nothing there. From my point of view, uh, this story basically broke into the national headlines in 1989, 1990, and it was deep concern everywhere over this. And I would say the, the, the evidence is much stronger today that we have a problem than it was five or six years ago. Um, however, uh, in, you know, we're in a kind of in a non-regulatory climate. We're in a let industry do it all. The government doesn't want to get involved. Basically, um, you're going to see a denial of this risk. And, and I'm not saying that you know that we know that it's a cost engine. We know that people are dying. But there are so many studies pointing to a health risk, pointing to a leukemia risk, brain cancer risk, potentially breast cancer risk, um, and now, most interestingly, an Alzheimer's risk. And a lot of these diseases, leukemia, brain cancer, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, they're all going up. There's no doubt. The statistics show that these risks are on the increase, but we don't know why. Electric blankets. now. I, I've seen data about electric blankets that are like, like whoppers in terms of giving off EMF. It's like you know, sleeping under a very high voltage power line every night. And you know, there is a, an example when you don't have to be exposed because a nice wool blanket, a nice down comforter will keep you just as warm uh, through the night. And so there's absolutely no reason to bathe yourself in electricity every night. Um, you know, we don't have the smoking gun because we don't really understand the mechanism of, of why these electromagnetic fields um, are a problem. But as I said, there's so much data out there that, you see, the crux of the issue for my mind is people think of this stuff, EMF, as one thing. There is EMF out there and it's killing me. That's completely the wrong way to think about it. Electromagnetic fields, there's an infinite variety of them. Uh, there's many EMF, as many EMFs out there as there are organic chemicals. And we know that some chemicals are bad for you, some are good for you, and some are fairly innocuous. So it is probably with EMFs. Dr. Schlesen, oh, I should also note that, that Lewis Schlesen has a PhD from MIT in environmental uh, policy. policy, so he is uh, quite the science journalist. Lewis, you were talking about the many forms of, uh, of electro, uh, you're talking about EMF in, 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 in many manifestations. There's an infinite variety of types of electromagnetic fields. Think about radar, for instance. There, there's, a, there's a radar station um, out on the Cape in, in, here in Massachusetts that um, is called Pave Pause. And, and it's been a center of controversy for, for, for many, many years. That, that installation, that radar unit, can basically recognize a, an object the size of a grapefruit at three thousand miles. I mean, this, this, the whole system is for an early warning system for uh, submarine launch missiles. But think about what you have to do with that radiation to be able to, A, send out a signal, interrogate, as they would probably say, a grapefruit at, at that distance, and then watch that reflection uh, back and be able to tell the speed, size, and direction of movement. I mean, what I'm trying to point out is that there are so many variables here, and we are, we are so good at using this technology, this radiation, for military purposes and for commercial purposes, for industrial purposes. What we fail to do is look at the biological impact, the potential biological effects of this radiation. And if you have, my view, not, not proven, but certain types of this radiation, basically you're like an antenna, you're a receiver, you're a radio stage, you're a radio, uh, I'm sorry, a radio receiver. And certain kinds of signal will be able to be received by your body. I'm quite convinced. And certain will you know, pass right through, have no effect. Essentially, um, what we have to find out are which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, and which ones we don't have to worry about. I mean, the FDA, for instance, has approved um, devices which can help heal bones using very specialized, patented, if you will, signals um, to help bones knit together. The question is, if that can happen, what else can the radiation be doing? Obviously, the concern here is that if we have an industry that makes its money off, off this, off this process, and it is able to warp, to pervert the regulatory apparatus. I mean, we got a problem, and it's nothing new. It's happened with asbestos, and it happened with lead. I mean, it's happened with so many poisons. 
do you feel comfortable about how, oh, the supervision, the regulation of, of, of electromagnetic radiation, of EMF, stands today? There is no supervision. It's a big joke, basically. Nothing is going on. I mean, the, the, you've got to understand what, what, what's going on here. You, you're talking about, you know, up, up to half a trillion dollars, probably more, of GNP. You're talking all the electric utility companies. You're talking about all the computer companies, because computers also emit electromagnetic radiation. One of the big issues was whether pregnant women um, had a you know, risk to their, to their babies uh, from sitting in front of a computer all day. And I'm glad to say, because I, and I think Microwave News would take some credit for this, now all computer terminals, basically from major manufacturers, are shielded. So computers, electric utilities, what we blithely call the military industrial complex, consumer electronics, all, all of this um, technology is dependent on the free use and, and a belief that there is no effect of weak fields or weak radiation. I mean, this is the old joke is if you or I go bankrupt, who cares? If Citibank goes bankrupt, the government you know, uh, comes in and saves the day. Well, it's a bit like that in electromagnetic fields. We're all exposed. It's everywhere. So nobody wants to allow for the possibility that maybe there is something. There's just too much at stake. There's too many dollars at risk if you were to allow that this biological effect is possible. I mean, the computer industry is to be congratulated for shielding um, the terminals, the VDTs, if you will. But it turned out, the Swedes told us a decade ago, that it costs basically 75 cents a set to do it. I mean, if you do it at the factory, it costs practically nothing. But what happened, essentially, is that we solved the problem without ever admitting or deciding whether there was you know, a biological risk at all. So here we are, all over again, 10 years later, worrying about cellular phones. This is, it's, it's a different type of radiation, it's a different, you use it differently, but it's the same issue. You're holding an electromagnetic, uh, uh, sorry, a device which emits electromagnetic radiation right next to your body. As long as it's, you know, a two-piece phone wouldn't be a problem because, you know, by the time it got to you, it, it's not a problem. The radiation would be probably too weak. But any time, you, you know, whether you put an electric blanket on your body, whether you put a laptop on your, on your knees, or you use a cellular phone, you're putting a device that emits electromagnetic radiation um, right near you, and that's the issue that needs to be resolved. Whether it's one type of technology or another, it's the same generic problem as far as I'm concerned. You can avoid using an electric blanket. I mean, that's easy. Power lines, is there any way to shield power lines or to shield people from power lines? The, the, the simple answer is no. Um, you, you, th there's nothing you can add to your house, say, uh, that will shield the fields. However, the utility company can do a lot. By the, 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 in fact, the EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, many years ago showed with very minimal expense they could reduce the fields by basically half just by jiggling the lines and, and changing the configuration a little bit. Nothing major here. Um, it can be done. Listen, we're, we're very bright people. This is, this is, I have no problem that if we set our mind to this, um, that we will solve this problem. We will find, in, the computer is 75 cents a set. It was supposed to be insoluble before that. It turns out it, it was cheap. The first thing is to decide we want to address it. And, and I think, you know, let me be clear, I'm not a Luddite. I love, you know, I love electricity. I love to read at night. I, we couldn't do microwave news without computers. Um, but, you know, all you have to do is decide that you want to know, do the studies, and we'll find a solution. I have no doubt in my mind we will find solutions. But the first step is to know what the problem is. Dr. Lewis lesson, what, what are we all going to do? What, are pe what should people do? I think the most important lesson of what's happened in the last few years is the power of the public. I, what I've tried to say to, to you today is that there's so much capital, that is so much money that is fighting against recognition of this problem and to do something about it and to try and see what the health risks may be 
that there's, there's no one out there, and that there's no organized group that's fighting to try and resolve this issue. And, and you know, we certainly don't expect the companies or the military to get too involved, but what's interesting is no consumer groups, no labor unions, no, even the environmental groups don't know what to do with this, and they've basically stayed out of the fray. The only reason we know as much as we do today is because of the public. That is, the grassroots. They're the people who want to know, and they're the people who have registered their opinion with the elected officials. And what I would say to the listeners out there is if you are concerned, and I might say that a few years ago, USA Today did a poll of its readers and said, what issue most disturbs you, concerns you, and, 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 and interests you? And you know, the overwhelming response was EMS, and, you know, whether it's from power lines or electric blankets or, or, or you know, radio waves from, from cellular phones or whatever. This is what they wanted to know about. And because of the outpouring of support, you know, we got a law passed. There is now a research program that is actually coming to, to an end now that, that you know, pumped millions of dollars in trying to do research. But this is not going to be a simple problem. This is going to take years. And one bunch of money is not going to, uh, I mean, it's like you know, any other environmental issue, whether it's breast cancer or asbestos or, 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 or pesticides. We, we need an ongoing uh, effort. We need to find out out over the long term. And it's only with the pressure of the public are we ever going to get there. And so if people are concerned, and I'm not trying to incite concern, but if you are concerned, make write a letter. Tell your elected official, this is what you want to know. Because uh, I might say, you know, one of the one of the issues um, that is most in the public mind at the moment is cellular and PCS towers. Basically, there's 100,000 to 200,000 of these towers being built all across the country. And because of basically industry lobbying, the public is not allowed to raise concerns about the exposure from radio waves from those towers. It is, it is in the law that you, once the FCC has set standards, which it now has, you cannot raise this issue again. I mean, I find it deeply ironic in this, in this Republican environment of, you know, where we want to turn back authority to the states, get power back to the people. Oh, no, not that one. No, you know, not the ones where, you know, people have legitimate concerns. I mean, I have to say that, you know, my concern is much more with the phone you hold up to your head than the tower in the neighborhood, because they're pretty weak. But certainly, I would not want them on schools. I don't want them on playgrounds. I don't want them on kindergartens. Unfortunately, the phone companies are willing to pay a lot of money for rent. And, you know, listen, we don't know very much about this problem. And in our ignorance, keep them away from children. I mean, this is the basic lesson. But under the law, you can't raise those objections. Dr. Slesson, I mean, I, in fact, have a cell phone. Uh, I kind of, like, moderately use it. I, because of, of my concern about EMF, do you suggest people maybe not buy cell phones, get them, have them, not use them much? How should we handle this? Listen, they're extraordinarily useful devices, and I'm not going to tell anyone not to get one. I mean, it's, if you live on a country road and you're worried and you have a flat tire, what better thing to have than a communication device that can call help? I mean, people have to understand the benefits and the risks. And the thing is, is a lot of people use cell phones when they don't need to, when you can have a regular old-fashioned wired phone. And what I would say is, you know, use it if you need to, but whenever possible, use the old technology. Uh, if you're in your home or if you're, in, you know, if, you, if you're in your office, don't whip out the cell phone. Use the old-fashioned uh, phone. And, um, you know, y y when you need to use the, f the cell phone, do it. But, you know, the more worried you are, less you should use it. And we've missed microwave ovens. We've missed these microwave stoves that are ever, every, even at this TV station in the lunchroom. What about microwaves? My concern about microwave ovens is children. Um, again, it's your it's your proximity to the radiating device. And what I worry about is on a, on a on a rainy day, kids don't know what to do. Hey, let's put something in the microwave oven and watch it cook. When the kids do that, they're putting their eye, which is uh, the most sensitive organ to the point of maximum leakage, the, you know, basically the, the door seal. And you know, it doesn't take long to get a door. They all leak. Let me be clear. All microwave ovens leak. The question is, they don't. You know, how much do they leak? And they don't leak very much. There are rules. See, this is the only 
basically a mission standard the federal government has ever set for microwaves is for ovens. And basically, it helped the industry sell a product because it assured safety. If you don't put your iron next to the seal for many, for long periods, you have nothing to worry about. But that's the thing: is keep your kids away from the oven when it's on. And in fact, as it turns out, you know, the, there is a, because it draws power. There's also a fairly large electromagnetic field, which is different from the microwaves. Um, around a, an operating uh, microwave oven. So basically, keep your distance. Uh, any device that radiates, keep your distance. What about these gauze meters? Uh, these are little devices. They don't cost too much. I, I've seen them in catalogs. Basically 100 bucks. You can get a decent one for about $100. And they measure the, the... They measure not the microwaves, but the EMF. OK. And you know, here at Microwave News, what we do is we, we, uh, we have a list. And if people want to find out what they're being exposed to, I mean, I've done this with journalists, with a lot of people. Give them a meter and walk around. In fact, if we walked around the studio, you'd see that there's a lot of, of electromagnetic radiation right here. Um, the electromagnetic fields are quite high. Any place you have a lot of electronic equipment. So basically, if you're concerned, the only way to know is to measure it. Also to read Microwave News. How can people subscribe to Microwave News, uh, connect to my, what's your address, what's your email, what's your website? Basically, I have to say that Microwave News is, is fairly expensive, it's fairly detailed, but I would, you know, if you're interested, get your library. I mean, it's, it's not for everybody, but, you know, if, you, if the community is interested, get one for your library. And, and uh, you know, for the local library, I mean, the New York Public Library gave me the greatest honor in the world when they subscribed for three years in a row, you know, three years at a time, excuse me. Um, Write to us, Microwave News, Post Office Box, 1799, 1799, Grand Central Station, New York, New York, 10163, or email us at mwn at pobox.com, or look us up on the World Wide Web at www.microwavenews.com. What could be simpler? This has been Enviro Close-Up. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching.